In 2010, ordinary Russians launched a rather extraordinary protest. This protest was inspired by Moscow's notoriously bad traffic. <laughs> Making matters worse were the VIP cars of the rich and powerful. You could recognize these cars by their blue lights. Those lights signaled that drivers could ride with impunity, exempt from normal traffic laws. Anger over these blue light drivers bubbled over in 2010, when an executive killed two women with his Mercedes. Around that same time, an older online video resurfaced. This video showed a man taking a blue bucket, like the one you buy in toy stores, and putting it on the roof of his car. Why did he do this? He was just trying to make fun of the blue light drivers, and he was also trying to mock the police. So in 2010, a well-known radio host in Russia posted this video on his blog. He called out to other Russian drivers to do the same thing. This was the idea. You go to a toy store, you buy a blue bucket, you tape it to the roof of your car. Now, Russian road regulations apparently allow for the, good, the transport of goods by car. So the idea was, if anyone stops you, you and asks you why you have a bucket on your car, you say, I'm just transporting a good by car. So that's what people did. The blue bucket protests were silly and fun, at least for the drivers. The police were a little bit less amused. Some put buckets on their cars, others honked their horns in solidarity. Videos started appearing on the internet. Now, this obviously was not simply about cars. In Moscow, there were not a lot of places where ordinary Russians could speak truth to power. But there was at least one place where Russians of all stripes had no choice but to interact. That space was traffic. The blue bucket protests allowed ordinary Russians to send Moscow's VIP drivers a message that they could not ignore. Most important, Russians sent a powerful message to each other. They would see the other blue bucket drivers out on the streets and know that they were not alone. And this empowered them to keep fighting for change. Now, did the blue bucket protests cause a Russian revolution? No, obviously not. But it still marked a pivotal moment in Russia's internet history. It demonstrated that the internet could be a platform for collective action. And this in and of itself is the greatest threat to authoritarian regimes. Governments that censor the internet may appear to be concerned about freedom of speech or freedom of information, but they are far more concerned about freedom of assembly. And therein lies the power of the internet. It is both a gathering place and a tool for collective action. The internet also has a powerful psychological impact on dissidents. I just wrote a book that chronicles the lives of internet activists in China, Cuba, and Russia. The title is a quote from the internet activist Michael Anti. Ten years ago, I asked Anti if the internet could really be a game changer in China, given that there was so much censorship and surveillance. Yes, he said. Why? He replied, because now I know who my comrades are. On the internet, on the, perhaps only on the internet, Antti knew who was on his side. He knew that others were fighting the same fight. So let me just quickly tell you a little story about his background, which will explain how the internet actually transformed him from a loyal communist supporter into a dissident. Anti, born as Zhao Jing, was not, did not, was not born a dissident. He was born believing very firmly in his government and in his party. 
and he grew up poor, he grew up believing everything that he saw on state television. So in 1989, which as many of you know was the year of the very famous Tiananmen crackdown, in 1989, Auntie was watching state coverage, he was watching television about this, and he had no reason to doubt the official account which said that the army was just trying to protect the country from these violent and these violent students that did not love China. So fast forward 10 years, 1999. At this point, he still, he still supports his government, but he's beginning to have doubts about what really happened at Tiananmen. And so he downloads a newsletter from an overseas dissident website. Now, this newsletter was, was, was blocked in China, but of course he was able to get, it, get to it via a proxy server. Once he does this, he finds horrifying photos and accounts from the Tiananmen crackdown, and his world basically is turned upside down. He felt cold, he felt betrayed, he felt completely alone. But he didn't feel like talking about his discovery with his friends, and he didn't feel like talking about this discovery with his parents. And in China, as I'm sure many of you know, there are not a lot of physical spaces where people who feel disillusioned with the government can find each other. So, Auntie turned to the internet. In a later online post, he described how he felt that night. He avoided such direct references as June 4th or Tiananmen crackdown. Instead, he talked about George Orwell. Before going online, he wrote, for 20 years, I lived in 1984. I absolutely didn't know what really happened in the world. I only knew what they wanted me to know. He continued to describe that moment when his illusions about communism were forever shattered by images that he saw on the internet. In those moments, he wrote, everything was destroyed. My dreams about my country and my society were all destroyed. So the internet transformed Zhao Jing into Michael Anti. That's Michael Anti, the pen name that he uses online. In 2005, Microsoft, not the Chinese government, Microsoft, <laughs> shut down Auntie's Chinese blog, propelling him to a sort of international fame and sparking a debate about the role of Western companies who censor their content in China. That's a whole other story. Auntie created a vibrant online universe in what is essentially a one-party state. On the internet, his internet world was split into liberals and Democrats and rightists and leftists and opinion leaders and followers. You can see the beginning of political parties, he once told me. Now, I think I need to stop here and, and, and confirm that the Chinese internet is far from a free space. China's pragmatic leaders understood early that if China wanted to be an economic superpower, it needed the internet. You can't be an economic power without having the internet. Today, there are some 600 million Chinese online. And yet, the party has remarkably kept pace with a pretty comprehensive censorship mechanism. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Chinese censorship. Very brief overview. In my view, there are four main components of Chinese censorship. The first, perhaps the most famous, is the Great Firewall of China, or the GFW. This refers mostly to content from outside of China that is blocked inside China. So this could be anything from Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, now the New York Times, many other sites as well. Now, the Great Firewall is a little more porous than people sometimes realize. There are ways around it. So some of the most commonly cited ways are virtual private networks or proxy servers. So you will, for example, Twitter is blocked in China, but there are still a sizable number of people using Twitter in China. That's one example. 
The second is filtered keywords. Now, this is, this is, you will see a lot of stories about this in, in the media. This refers to words that are considered too sensitive to be online. So this can be anything related to democracy or human rights or a sensitive incident that's happening somewhere. Um, and what's amazing about this is that even though there are a lot of words that are filtered, Chinese netizens are very creative in getting around this. So they will perhaps purposely misspell the word or they will infuse Roman letters into the word, or they'll put asterisks into the words. Anything that will, that will get the word to go through this, the filters. And one of the most famous examples of this is you look at June 4th, the, the anniversary of Tiananmen, very sensitive term. You can't write June 4th, so what do you do? You write May 35th, okay? <laughs> this is a very well-known example. Now, of course, so many people started using May 35th that that became a sensitive term too. And then what do you do? You write May 36th minus one or you know, something, I don't know. People, people are always finding ways around this. So that's why there are human censors. Human censors are people who are actual real human beings who are smart enough to catch on to these little word games and they can sort of see what's happening. And Nobody knows exactly how many people are monitoring the Chinese internet all the time, but I think what's interesting about this is the kind of person that is doing it. I think when you think of a Chinese internet censor, you imagine some person in a trench coat with sunglasses, you know, censoring the internet. In reality, the people who are censoring the internet, a lot of them work at internet companies. So these could be young, urban, well-educated, cosmopolitan. These are people who work at China's big internet companies because they're responsible for the content that goes online. And my book actually profiles one of these people who is a provocative blogger on his free time and an internet censor during the day. <laughs> and he didn't really see a conflict so much with this because in his view, he believed in the internet, he thought the internet was transforming China, and he wanted his own internet company, and that means you play by certain rules. So he censored the internet for his job. The fourth level, which in some ways, this is actually, I think, the most effective in level of censorship is self-censorship. This refers to all the information that never makes it online in the first place, right? That's me sitting at my desk saying, I could write about this, I could criticize that. You know what, it's too much trouble, I'm just gonna write about something else. So when we talk about circumvention technology or all these ways to get around the Great Firewall, that's not gonna help this problem. This is a very difficult problem to solve. And the China scholar, Perry Link, actually came up with kind of a nice image for this. He referred to this as the anaconda in the chandelier, okay? I don't know why the ana anaconda is in the chandelier, but the idea is that there is a snake in a chandelier coiled above, and it might never strike you, it might never hurt you, it might not even do anything at all, but just the mere fact that it's there in the room is gonna cause you to alter your behavior. Right? So that's the idea. It's, the, it's that you might not even get any direction to censor yourself, but you're aware of some threat somewhere nearby. So, as you can see, Chinese censorship is pretty intense and pretty pervasive. But again, back to my original point, in my view, the power of the Chinese internet does not lie simply in the spread of information or the spread of free speech. It's in its ability to promote freedom of assembly, or at the very least, freedom of virtual assembly. So it's worth noting here that Chinese censors are far more worried about collective action than they are about the spread of information. So some researchers at Harvard did put together some very interesting data where they analyzed the count of posts that were censored related to news and policy events compared to the amount that was censored that was related to collective action. So if you look here, and you might not be able to see this chart that clearly, but you get the idea. If you look here, the red signifies the count censored on items that were related to news and policy events, right? You look here, these are censorship during collective action events. So again, what you want to look at is the red, which is the count censored. So this is collective action, and this is news and policy events. So this all this if you might want to this is all worth looking into more deeply but this gives you an idea of the fact that what is most sensitive is any kind of any kind of 
material on the internet that suggests that people should gather together and take action together is far more sensitive than just criticizing the government online. So, of course, in China, it's still very dangerous to organize a demonstration online. And yet, re regardless, the internet still is a powerful tool for collective action. People go online to campaign for cleaner water and cleaner air. Individuals join forces to demand justice and accountability. If a person is treated unfairly, others will rush to their defense. If I don't stand up for you, the thinking goes, who will stand up for me? And perhaps most important, thanks to the internet, critics know that they are not alone. Now I know who my comrades are. In China, this is a life-changing realization. I want to move over to Cuba, where the internet is changing lives as well. Now, it's kind of funny to talk about Cuba and China in the same speech because the level of internet penetration is so different. Most people in Cuba don't have internet access at home, and using the internet can be prohibitively expensive. If they want to use the internet in a hotel, for example, it's extremely expensive. And yet, as all over the world, Cubans find ways to get online. So, for example, they will write their blog entries on home computers, save their blog entries on flash drives, and then spread their writing, use the flash drive to spread their writing either you know, from a hotel or an embassy or a place that has an internet connection. So Cubans love to talk. That's Joanny Sanchez, the Cuban blogger. She lo they love to talk about, Cuban bloggers will tell you about the power of the flash drive. You know, maybe they will take, put information on a flash drive and spread it manually to other Cubans. It's a lot slower than forwarding a link, but the information still gets around. And in Cuba, too, the, the internet has a powerful psychological effect. So my, my book also tells the story of a woman named Loritza, who did not set out to be a dissident blogger. She wa instead, she wanted to be a lawyer, like the one that she ones that she saw in the movies. She used to watch movies in Cuba, apparently from the United States, and she loved this idea of a lawyer doing everything in their power to defend their client. Now, once she actually graduated with a degree in law, she soon saw that being a lawyer in Cuba was not quite the same as the lawyers that she saw in the movies. First of all, she, was not making, she felt she was not making enough money to support her family. Second, she believed that most Cubans did not know their rights and that the rule of law was not being upheld. But the worst part of it for her was this feeling that she could not express herself. She felt that she could not air her complaints publicly, and she felt that her grievances were not reflected in the media. So she found the internet. On the, her blog, she would ba basically express her frustration. I write a blog because I can't access my country's media, was how she explained it. She wrote about her Cuba, the darker corners that did not appear in the press. She wrote about prostitution, she wrote about unemployment, she wrote about the law. Now, it is not easy to be a critical blogger in Cuba. When her name for, once her name first appeared on the web, Luritza said, authorities began watching her as if she were a laboratory rat. She believed that state security made contact with her friends, with her family, with her former classmates. Anybody who knew anything about her could give information about her. In Cuba, which has a large network of citizen informers, a phrase you often hear is, you never know who is who. For a Cuban blogger, that feeling of paranoia is magnified exponentially. Luritza saw agents and informers everywhere. She had all sorts of run-ins with her family. Her, you know, she, authorities confronted her father. She, a strange woman was lingering around her husband. All sorts of strange things happened with her son. And yet, here's the interesting part of this story. Even as the pressure and surveillance increased, Loritza felt more liberated than ever. Most Cubans couldn't read her writing due to the limited internet access in Cuba. But 
people outside of Cuba knew who she was. This meant that it would be far more difficult to simply make her disappear. To give you an example, one of Cuba's friend, one of Luritza's friends, another blogger, got detained a couple of years ago, and I was able to watch the whole thing unfold practically in real time on Twitter, and I was in New York. So it gives you an idea there is some degree of protection by having your name and your image online. For Luritza, expressing herself on her blog was a transformative experience, and that newfound confidence trickled into real life. Even as she maneuvered her way through surveillance and intimidation, she described herself as free. So, quickly, let's just return to Russia. I'm sure, as many of you have noticed, recently the Kremlin has been cracking down on the internet with various laws and regulations. And again, this is not simply because Putin wants to control the flow of information. The Kremlin, like all the other governments I mentioned, is worried about collective action and is worried about assembly. Alexei Navalny, a famous blogger and opposition activist, did not rise to fame simply by leaking sensitive information. Rather, he used the internet to mobilize people to act. Navalny has always been a realist. He understood early that he was trying to get a weary, cynical population to rally for change. Russians were not going to spring into action overnight. He had to start small. He told me in 2010, "I propose to people the comfortable way of struggle." Basically, what he was saying is that I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term slacktivism. You know, slacker activism. It's not a complimentary term. It's this idea of people are willing to like something on Facebook, but they're not willing to actually go out into the street. Navalny used this to his advantage. He wanted to show people that they could fight corruption and incompetence from the comfort of their living rooms, and that they could win. So, to give one small example, he has a site where people could report potholes that were supposed to be fixed and get them repaired. On a much grander scale, he used the internet to crowdsource scrutiny over suspicious government contracts. And over the years, Navalny and his followers got some small successes. Maybe they would have, maybe they would get some potholes fixed. Maybe they would force an official to resign. Maybe some suspicious government contracts would get annulled. But what he did manage to do was to show the To show ordinary Russians that the internet could be used as a platform for change, and it's no coincidence that since then Navalny has been placed under house arrest. Nor is it a coincidence that Russia has started clamping down on the web. Russia's internet crackdown began in, in earnest after late 2011 and early 2012, when tens of thousands of Russians took to the streets to protest election fraud. Social media played an important role in these protests, and not just by telling people where to go. People would go on Facebook, for example, and see that if they went out onto the streets, others would be there with them. Authoritarian regimes try to isolate critics from one another. In the internet age, this is increasingly difficult to do. Now, I'm not trying to say here that all internet activists are pro-democracy advocates. Nationalists and racists and all sorts of bad people use the internet too. Authoritarian regimes also use the internet to their advantage. They use technology to surveil, to monitor, to censor. But over the long term, they won't necessarily win. Even in the most repressive environments. The internet is helping to create a new kind of citizen. These citizens are networked, unafraid, and ready to act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank、Please、you so much. Please stay. Very nice.、Oh. Very interesting talk. So.
I don't know whether you are aware of last week, it was Internet Governance Forum in China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, got a, I got a mail from a Chinese friend and said, oh, they will turn off the Great Firewall during the conference. Mm -hmm. so it was like, oh, they, they just have a switch to it. Mm. So that was kind of interesting, I think. Yes, yeah, definitely. So Some people were saying that they were able to access previously on inaccessible sites during that forum. But then you would also see tweets from journalists saying, I'm at this major internet conference and I can't get onto the internet. So, <laughs> so it wasn't entirely true. It was just not you know, open and free for, <laughs> for a short while. <laughs> they still had struggles. It, well, yeah. there still seem to be problems. Okay. Do you know anything from the outcome of that conference? I mean, the... Like I the don't regime think is quite of <laughs> I don't think it's it's brought about a radical change yeah. in Chinese internet governance. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, thank you for your very good work. Thank you. And Richard, I would like to call for you to hand over our absolutely amazing gift. Oh, cool. I got one of these too. Richard made it. Thank himself. you. <laughs> so, for all those 3 billion people online and still growing. It's really cool. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, 